We're talking unique garden spaces and gorgeous orchids all coming up next. I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show. Isn't this a gorgeous orchid? It's called a moth orchid, and you water it in a very unique way. We'll get to that a little later in the show. But I want to talk just a moment about special garden rooms or spaces. In today's show, we're going to take a look at some that have unique personalities, like a rooftop garden and one that we'll see in Louisville, Kentucky that has a fern stumpery, a very old and Victorian idea, but very beautiful. I have this to share with you and much, much more right after this. Rooftop gardening has become very popular over the past few years. One in particular is on top of a hospital. Jonathan Gillette with Turnsall Siteworks tells us about this unique garden space including the challenges they had to overcome throughout the process. We are here today on a large commercial rooftop garden. This project was a very large building, a rooftop parking lot, and wanted to bring plantings to this uh, arena to give it a soothing, uh, more pleasing effect. We started off uh, by providing these fiberglass planters, which are very lightweight. And these particular uh, planters have an aluminum finish on them. We utilized a system here uh, that's designed to help the plants thrive rather than just survive, which can be a very much a challenge in container irrigation. Plants typically uh, suffer from one of two things. Uh, one is overwatering, and uh, that's very common. And the other, of course, is underwatering, where plants uh, just are not getting enough attention. So the system that we brought to this project takes care of both of those issues. Within each container, there is a plastic water reservoir, basically, that is uh, a holding area for the water. By having a reservoir of water down in the system, it greatly lengthens the amount of time that your uh, maintenance is gonna have to return to this planting in order to provide additional water. The way the water gets to the planting is through sub-irrigation. And on the bottom of that reservoir, there are little holes uh, that the water comes out of. And water uh, through capillary action will travel through any good soil planting mix upward. Water will not go down in soil until it hits a saturation point. There is a uh, moisture sensor, which you see here, that comes out of the reservoir. And it basically is just a clear plastic tube and it is a uh, micro porous fiber insert that goes into the end of that tube, which allows the flow of air into that tube and the release of water from the bottom. What's being achieved is a maximum moisture level for the planting at all times, uh, allowing an environment for the plants to thrive, not only survive. And throughout the whole period, you're maintaining a optimal moisture level. A lot of effort was uh, put into plant selection, uh, soil amendments, things of those nature, to bring a successful uh, green environment to uh, an otherwise concrete and steel environment. Well, you can see here we've used uh, Gulfstream Nandinas, uh, very large river birch, uh, Deodora cedars, American hollies. As you can see, uh, we've got a, a great softening effect that was achieved in front of the structure here. After the break, we'll take a trip to Louisville, Kentucky, and then we'll discover a delicious recipe, so don't go away. This has to be one of my favorite flowers. Of course, they're beautiful, and who wouldn't love something this gorgeous? But they're also very easy to grow. You see, these are moth orchids, sometimes called a butterfly orchid, but they're a phalaenopsis. Orchids are a very large family of plants, there are over 25,000 species that they know of, and there's still some that they're discovering. But this one, I think, for the average homeowner, is the most satisfying. As I mentioned, it's very easy to grow. Now, to produce orchids like this, you want to make sure that you give them some sunlight, but not direct light in a window. 
When it comes to watering, it's actually very simple. These are called Just Add Ice Orchids, and all you have to do is take three cubes of ice per plant per week, and that's all the water they need. The ice will melt, the orchid gets the moisture it needs, and you have a gorgeous flower. Now, these are wonderful to have in the house because the blooms will last so long. We're talking three to four months, these things will flower. So if you've never grown the Phalaenopsis orchid because you were afraid you would kill it, and a lot of people do because they overwater, try some of the Just Add Ice orchids, three cubes per plant per week. It's that simple. Okay, let's shift from orchids to taking a look at another breathtaking garden. Kentucky is full of historical landmarks and beautiful scenery. The Whitehall House and Gardens in Louisville was built in 1855 and is surrounded by several colorful garden rooms, including a fern stumpery. Ralph Archer, a volunteer for Whitehall House and Gardens, tells us exactly what a fern stumpery is. Whitehall is a historic home here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, about uh, 10 to 12 years ago, there was a start of restoration of the grounds. The Fern Woodland Garden started as a master gardener project, uh, as a display garden for ferns and woodland plants here. We had a lot of wood from tree removal uh, laying around, so we decided to build what we call the stumpery. The stumps provided a, a natural backdrop uh, for ferns and we feel enhanced the appearance of the garden. Most wooded areas have natural occurring uh, trees down, ferns growing next to uprooted trees. Uh, uh, and when we started the plants came out of four inch pots essentially and you can see uh, how they respond to their natural environment. We have uh, cinnamon fir. At the far end is the uh, royal fir, uh, the European form. Uh, in the middle, uh, we have the American form of the royal fir. We have woodland plants, uh, Hexastylus aerifolia, uh, we have Hexastylus shuttleworth eye. Uh, and bloom in the bog is uh, the bog orchid. We have a number of non-woodland plants, uh, non-native plants uh, in the garden. Uh, Pulmonaria, uh, Bruner, Brunera. One of the features of the garden is uh, planting uh, ferns on uh, wood. Uh, we have planted a number of Polypodia vulgare uh, in holes in the stumps uh, setting around the garden as containers. It provided a wonderful site for growing ferns in a natural setting uh, in a place that they really would cherish and would uh, grow readily and easily. Now when we return, we'll check out this mouth-watering recipe. We'll also see what's new at the Garden Home Retreat, so stay with us. The Pinky Winky Hydrangea is a great hydrangea that I've tested, has great staying power in the garden. You see the stems are very sturdy, so the blooms don't flop over when it rains. And the pinky winky flowers emerge white, and as they mature, the older blooms turn pink at the base, resulting in a shrub with enormous bicolored blooms. It's also an easy hydrangea to grow, and the soil pH has nothing to do with bloom color. You know, there's always so much going on out at the Garden Home Retreat. We produce so many vegetables and flowers. The only way I can do it is through my raised beds and having the right tools for the job. So let's take a look at how things were coming along in the garden last summer. 
You know, I just can't tell you how satisfying it is to grow some of your own vegetables. And one of the systems I've found that's helped me over the years is to create in a small space raised beds. In my garden in town, I have raised beds. They're much smaller than these, but it's a great way to contain the space in which you're working. Now here, we've got lots of stuff going on. We've got zinnias still in bloom. And what do you think about the way I'm growing my cucumbers this year? You can see I've got them growing over a hoop of concrete reinforcing wire. And right up here next to where I'm tilling, I've got the last hope for some cantaloupes this year. Now in this area, what I'm working up is a space for some of those Moulin Rouge sunflowers. I just love them. We planted them early in the season and now I'm gonna put in a second crop and I know I'll be able to get some blooms before frost. And what I'm doing here is working up the soil and integrating a lot of organic compost with some mycorrhize in it. That's the fungus that helps stimulate growth, particularly in new plants with those feeder roots. So I'm working that into the soil. And as soon as I get the seed in, well, the sunflowers will germinate in about six days with these temperatures and I'll have blooms within 45 days. It's pretty amazing. Okay, it's time for viewer questions. I have one here from Mary, Mary in Ohio, and she says, my neighbor has some really large elephant ears, Alan. I don't have a lot of space. Are there some that I can plant in containers and what would I plant with them? It's a great question. I had some really good success this year, Mary, with my elephant ears. This is a variety called Illustrous, and I like it because of the almost black coloration that you get with the green on the leaves. And you can see this is a very shallow container, but I've underplanted it with Creeping Jenny. Now this will take a lot of water and it will take a lot of shade. I had a few impatience in the back and you can see we just about finished up flowering. But all summer long, this was so beautiful. Now what really made this work is I started with a really great potting mix, Pro Mix for containers, and potted it up early in the season and kept it really moist because these plants really love a lot of water. But I think it turned out really well. So I can save these bulbs and move them out into the garden in the spring once the temperatures come up. The elephant ears like it really warm, so don't put them out too soon. Or I can just start again in the spring with some fresh bulbs and they'll be up and I'll have another gorgeous container like this. Good luck with yours. Now right after this quick break, we'll check out this delicious recipe, so make sure you stay with us. Now I want to show you one of my favorite recipes. The reason it's a favorite is that it's so simple and it makes great use of rosemary. Now I'm just taking this three pound chicken and I'm pulling its wings back and tucking them in like that. It just makes for a prettier presentation. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just cutting the back side here, the skin just making a cut where I can tuck a leg in like this and then I'm going to fold this other leg up under it like this. All right, now we've got a nice compact little package here. The rest is very simple. Rosemary and lemon will be the key ingredients. And I'm going to take two quarters, two quarter pieces of lemon and rub it on the bird and then I'm going to take and stuff that lemon rind up in the bird and the other one, making sure that I'm completely soaking it down with the lemon. And I'm gonna tuck that quarter up and then I've got two that are not going to be squeezed that I put up in the bird. Now this will help preserve moisture on the inside of it. All right, now with that in place, what we're going to do is take this rosemary. And I like to use about six or seven stems of it, I fold them, and I tuck this up inside the bird as well. So it's fully stuffed with this lovely fresh rosemary. Okay, now for the top of the bird, or the crust, what I like to do is take just a little bit of olive oil, up it over it like this, take a little salt, a little cracked pepper, and then some rosemary to go on the bird like this. Okay, it's about, it's finely chopped, about a teaspoon. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? All right, now I'm gonna place the bird in a baking pan. I've preheated the oven to 350. Now I've got 
a pound of potatoes here. And what I'm gonna do is take the rest of the olive oil, started with half a cup, I'll pour the olive oil all over the potatoes. I'm gonna add a small white onion. You can use as much onion as you like, the more the better as far as I'm concerned. I'm gonna add some salt, about a generous teaspoon of salt. And I'm taking the rest of that lovely rosemary and I'm sprinkling it all over it. Mixing this together. And then laying the potatoes all around the bird. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to cook this for about two hours, check on it. And what will happen is the juices of the chicken will conspire with the flavors of these potatoes and rosemary and you will have a wonderful meal. You want to cook this until the juice that's coming out of the chicken runs clear. Now it's time to pop in the oven. Now wasn't that simple? A great use for fresh rosemary from the garden. Well, we've certainly seen some beautiful and unique garden spaces in today's show, as well as some exotic plants. This illustrious elephant ear and these gorgeous moth orchids. Give them a try. Just add ice, that's all you have to do to water them. You may say, well, that seems mighty cold for these plants. Well, actually, the temperature of the ice doesn't bother them at all. And you need to always remember that if you're comfortable with the air temperature, the orchid is too. If you have any questions about today's show, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile